Hi everyone. This is our first educational video in which we will be focused in on surgery. The purpose of this educational video will be to teach a surgical house officer what one of the surgical chief residents thinks is important for you to know about a particular case. It's a short 10 or 12 minute vignette focusing in on three particular areas. What you need to know before the procedure, what you need to know during the procedure, and what you need to know after the procedure. Our visiting professor here today is Dr. Matt Dixon. He's one of the chief residents here at the Medical Center. And our procedure is the Whipple procedure. And they let me say this, a pancreatico duodenectomy. So Dr. Dixon, thank you so much for joining us here thank, today. Thank you for having and me, And we're Spare. very excited to try and make some video history, video education history. Well, I'm happy to be a part of it. So we wanted to start out by letting you talk for a couple of minutes about what you want the average surgery resident to know before the procedure. Well, I think the most important things to know, if you were to boil, boil it down, is to know the history of your patient, uh, as well as to know the indications for the procedure, uh, as well as the details of the staging workup. And you also were explaining to me before that many people with pancreatic cancer don't actually meet criteria to get a Whipple procedure and you said the primary problem is the disease is found too late and you wanted to spend a couple of minutes to talk about what it really means to be resectable. Sure, so uh, it's the, the anatomy in the area where the, the pancreatic head, the uncinate process, and the neck of the pancreas is, is a very uh, clustered area of anatomy. So when these tumors grow, they can grow to involve uh, adjacent vessels in particular, and that can uh, really change the, uh, the resectability criteria of these cancers. And it's something that you should review before going to the operating room. And as you emphasize in the bottom of the slide, it's important to discuss the case with the attending before you're in the operating room. Yes, absolutely. So you uh, you can you can talk to the uh, t talk to the attending about uh, their particular approach to the uh, to the operation, uh, as well as to uh, to ask questions about the uh, the patient and their history and uh, and the workup that was done. So one of the things that you were trying to explain to me before is, as a non-surgeon that the indications for needing a Whipple procedure are having pancreatic cancer, but you said it's a little bit more complicated than that, and I thought you could uh, talk for a minute or two about that. Sure, yeah, so you know, we do this operation for, uh, for other reasons than just pancreatic adenocarcinoma, that being a, a, a very common one, uh, but some other indications for this procedure could include periampulary cancers, uh, that can include uh, duodenal uh, adenocarcinomas, as well as cholangiocarcinomas. Um, introductal papillary mucinous neoplasms of the pancreas is another indication for doing uh, these operations uh, in addition to neuroendocrine tumors which are located uh, in the head of the pancreas. But you were also were explaining to me that in general um, it's some kind of tumor in the head of the pancreas and that it a, a you're not doing anything too particularly different with these various kinds of cancers? Or? No, the, yeah, so these, these uh, different pathologies will all undergo uh, the same, the same uh, Whipple procedure. And I guess the, the next step that you wanted to talk about was what the... Um, actually, I wanted to ask you another quick question. You were saying that the focus, the other, one of the other important things that the resident needs to know is the details of the workup of the particular patient and that's before the resident gets into the operating room that day and you wanted you were telling me before some of the important issues uh, regarding the workup sure so so part of the workup which is going to be very important uh, and is part of assessing whether or not these patients are resectable uh, will be uh, it will boil down a lot to imaging so the cat scan uh, with good IV contrast um, is is going to be very important for assessing the uh, the characteristics of the tumor, its relation to vessels that are in the area, um, as well as any um, vessel um, anomalies, uh, which are important to know uh, before going to the operating room. Uh, in addition to that, endoscopic ultrasound is also an important staging modality, which can also be used to assess um, uh, resectability of the pancreas, and it also gives you a means of being able to biopsy these lesions so before going to the operating room. So CAT scan and endoscopic ultrasound. And those are two very important ones, yes. So then one of the themes that you've been emphasizing to me throughout this is for the 
house officer to understand the general anatomy and the specific anatomy of that particular patient, if you wanted to expand upon that a little bit, how important that is. Sure. So uh, the so certain vessel abnormality ab- anomalies that, uh, that can be present uh, can include the uh, replaced right hepatic artery coming off of the superior mesenteric artery, and that can um, be, that's important for you to know um, before going to the uh, before going to the OR if they have that vessel anomaly because that can add a layer of confusion when you're doing your dissection and may uh, lead to accidentally injuring that uh, that vessel or uh, or dividing it. Um, and uh, um, that that's really kind of one of the main anomalies that uh, that's important for us to uh, to know. And then you said some of the other important things for the trainees to know about on the day of surgery is uh, I just want to bring a couple of these up. One you said was talking in detail with the attending surgeon and the patient beforehand and some of the important interactions that happen with the anesthesiologist, if you wanted to spend a few minutes on sure. those two areas. Uh, I think it's always important to speak with the attending uh, before going to the operating room because different attendings will do the cases differently. Uh, and uh, um, just in terms of the uh, the sequence of the steps of the operation as well as the types of reconstructions that uh, that they may do. Uh, it's also very important to uh, to have good communication with your anesthesiologist post, both preoperatively and intraoperatively um, in terms of the uh, different types of invasive lines that they want present for monitoring. Um, so, uh, some anesthesiologists like to put in uh, large cordis uh, central lines um, for rapid infusion of, uh, of blood products and fluids in case there is some uh, some bleeding intraoperatively, um, as well as uh, putting in epidural catheters for pain control post-op uh, and arterial lines, uh, as well as a Foley catheter to be able to really closely monitor the patient during these uh, these what can often sometimes be uh, difficult and long operations. All right, so I've made it. I'm a, I'm a junior house officer. I've read about the Whipple procedure. I've worked with my attending. I'm, I'm in the OR now. And uh, as you've coached me to say this properly, this is a pancreaticoduodenectomy with a pancreaticocolidocogastrojejunostomy. Very good. So I think I'm going to send out <laughs> to you at this point and let you sure. take it from there. So this is a cartoon which, uh, which on the left side you see uh, what the anatomy looks like before the surgery as well as our pancreatic tumor and the reason that we're doing this operation. And then on the, on the right side of the screen you see the reconstruction afterwards. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the basic steps of, of the procedure, uh, we always like to start out with a diagnostic laparoscopy because uh, sometimes there can be um, stage four carcinomatoses uh, where the pancreas has spread to uh, to different areas of the peritoneum, um, and that will basically render that patient unresectable at that point. So it's important to have a look around the abdomen before you go making a big incision. Um, to, uh, to start your resection as these patients will not benefit from uh, in the long term from having uh, their Whipple procedure done. And you were explaining to me before that this is done routinely on every patient before a Whipple's begun in general, you Th- said. Yes, that's correct. And that, that patients are aware that this may in fact be an outcome, that they may not actually undergo the procedure. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, it's something that does happen um, in, not, not infrequently. And you were saying even with appropriate imaging and all that, they're still not 100%. Yeah, it's very difficult to be able to identify um, peritoneal implants and carcinomatosis just on, uh, on a CT scan. So the, the best way of being able to diagnose that is by doing a uh, diagnostic laparoscopy and looking directly. And so how do you, so how do, you do a Whipple? <laughs> so after our diagnostic uh, laparoscopy, uh, if you're doing a, uh, an open Whipple procedure, we'll then make our incision. Uh, that will either be a right subcostal incision or a upper midline incision. You'll start by mobilizing the, uh, the, right, col- the right colon uh, and then from there doing a, a coker maneuver to get the duodenum and the head of the pancreas uh, out of the retroperitoneum and be able to assess uh, the relationship of the tumor to uh, the nearby vessels, those being the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery. From there, you'll enter the lesser sac going through the gastrocolic ligament, uh, and you can find the superior mesenteric vein at this point by following the metacolic vein down to, uh, to the superior mesenteric vein, and that will be right at the inferior border of the pancreas. Uh, from there, uh, it's common to, to take the gallbladder off of the liver bed uh, to dissect out the common hepatic duct and then divide it. Uh, from there, we'll go and dissect out the gastroduodenal artery and ligate and divide that. 
Um, at this point, if you're doing a, a classic Whipple procedure where you're taking the, uh, the pylorus with the specimen, you will do an antrectomy. Um, and then from there, it's common to, uh, to lift up the transverse colon, find the ligament of trites, divide that, and then divide uh, the proximal jejunum. And then you'll move the, uh, uh, the rest of the duodenum uh, through the transverse mesocolon uh, to the right uh, of, the, uh, of the vessels. I could listen um, to you all day long. So wait, <laughs> do you take out the gallbladder also? Yes, and that's the gallbladder is part of it. Procedure? Yes, that's correct. Oh. All the gallbladder always comes out. Um, so from here, uh, what we'll do is create a retropancreatic tunnel by following right on top, right between the superior mesenteric vein and the uh, uh, the posterior surface of the pancreas, uh, and then we will divide the uh, the pancreas. Uh, and from from here, the, what's left is uh, dissecting and and taking off the uh, the what's known as the mesopancreas from the uh, superior mesenteric artery and vein. And from there, you will then by, by dividing that, your specimen is essentially dissected out, and you'll send that off to Pathology. It's also important to mark your pancreatic duct margins in your uh, in your bile duct margins uh, and sending and doing frozen sections on these to make sure that uh, you have a negative margin. And from there, you will then start your reconstruction. And after your reconstruction, it will look like uh, Wait, what is can on I the ask right. A question before we do our yes. reconstruction. So, um, d um, the particular place that you divide the pancreas is that done by feel or is there a particular so anatomic you will, anatomic area that you Yeah, do? so it's 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 the retropancreatic tunnel is between the superior mesenteric vein and the and the posterior surface of the pancreas. And uh, and that's the neck of the pancreas. And you were saying do you have to wait for the results of the uh, frozen section to know whether or not you can start your reconstruction. Yeah, that's that's important to know because you don't want to have to take down your anastomoses and then um, and then have to re-resect and then uh, and then send take that out, out to more pathology. Pancreas. That's correct. And the idea behind leaving the pancreas that doesn't have tumor in is in it is that you get you have pancreatic function left, which is obviously an important thing to do. Absolutely, yeah. You have both uh, exocrine and endocrine function left in the pancreas. So now we've done the taking out the cancer part of the operation, and now we have to put the patient back together. So what happens That's now? right. So the first step here is to perform your uh, pancreatic ejeginostomy. Uh, that's probably the most common uh, reconstruction. Um, you can do a pancreatic gastrostomy as well. Um, so the point being that you do your pancreatic anastomosis first, followed by your uh, hepatic ejeginostomy, and that's where you are, so you're going to do um, an end to uh, side anastomosis to this loop of jejunum that you've brought up to reconstruct the pancreatic biliary limb. And lastly, we will uh, follow that with our gastrojejunostomy, so we have uh, um, so we can have continuity of the gastrointestinal tract. And you were explaining to me that the pancreatic ejeginostomy is the technically most difficult part or reconstruction. Uh, that that it's one of the more challenging parts of this operation. That's correct. And is that just because the pancreas is difficult to? operate on or what's the well, idea Well, it's, it, I mean, it, it does have to do with that and it also um, has the gr greatest, more so it has the greatest potential um, to to leak uh, out of all three of the anastomoses. And so you've uh, successfully created all these and then you just sew the abdomen Close it's again. important to, so what's, what, what is a common practice, uh, especially um, here at Maimonides, is that we will leave drains. Um, you'll you, we will leave 10 flat uh, JPs, one anterior to uh, the pancreatic ejeginostomy, and then one that goes behind uh, the pancreatic ejeginostomy that will also drain the, uh, the hepatic ejeginostomy. So they drain, so one drain will sit here and then come out uh, through the right side of the abdomen, and then the other one will go behind the jejunum by the hepatic ejeginostomy and then sit behind the pancreatic ejeginostomy. Um, so we did it. So the patient gets extubated, goes to the recovery room, and goes to the floor. And this I can sort of focus a little bit. So the patient goes to some sort of a monitored bed. Many hospitals, intensive care units for patients like this for the first couple of days. That yes, that's right? correct. Yeah, so it's very common for, for patients to go, uh, if they don't stay in the, the recovery room uh, overnight, they will go to a, 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 at least a, a step-down um, monitored bed, if not the intensive care unit. And again, 
you emphasize here communication, I assume you mean to the receiving team or if there's an ICU team involved, that kind of situation. Yeah, communication is always very important uh, to let them, let them know what was done in the operating room and especially what, what drains are what. And it's important to label them and communicate this to, uh, to the team so that they know where these drains are sitting uh, and it, whether or not there is a, uh, a feeding tube that should also be labeled as well as the, uh, the nasogastric tube. And it's also important to know that if, if um, not to manipulate these tubes and if uh, if you do to uh, to call the assistance of, uh, of a senior resident or an attending to help you and speaking of drains if I just wanted to go back for one slide for one second so the in general or is it is there such a thing is the nasogastric tube across this anastomosis or does it stay in the stomach that's fairly common yes that we will put uh, uh, that we'll put the, the nasogastric tube in through the anastomosis into the efferent limb as it will go down here. And not every patient who gets a Whipple procedure gets a feeding jejunostomy. Not everyone, no. Um, but it, but it, this that is more, um, you know, that's that, that would be attending preference. Uh, it hasn't necessarily uh, been shown to uh, result in uh, you know an improved function per se. But so some patients can not need one and start eating on their own. That's correct. I mean, or is that sort of the plan? Is that the that's, idea? That's the plan. Yes. And then we uh, wanted to conclude by sharing some of the most important potential complications that a trainee needs to look for in a patient who's undergone a pancreatic duodenectomy. So why don't you go? Yeah. Over so with those. any big surgery, there's obviously some potential for some big complications. And if you really, you can kind of break this down and think about what could go wrong with each one of your anastomoses. Uh, a common one uh, will be a pancreatic leak. Um, so approximately 20% of patients may develop uh, some form of leak at the pancreatic or jejunostomy. And the way that we can predict that is by checking the what comes out of the JP drains that we have left around the anastomoses um, to check the levels of the amylase and compare that with what uh, the serum amylase levels are. Uh, some other things that can uh, go wrong, the hepatic jejunostomy in only about 1 to 2% of cases uh, can leak. Um, and uh, as far as the gastrojejunostomy goes, um, what can be an important um, complication here is delayed gastric emptying. Uh, and that, that is very common. Anywhere from between 15 and 25% of patients may experience some gastric, uh, delayed gastric emptying. So this would be like continued elevated nasogastric tube output? Is that That's the correct. Idea? Yeah. And uh, some other things that are important to know that can go wrong, uh, the infectious complications um, can also be a uh, uh, very important cause of morbidity in these patients. Bleeding is also a concern. Um, this can manifest as uh, blood coming out in the drains uh, or changes in the patient's hemodynamics. Uh, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, the main concern here is a uh, blowout of your gastroduodenal artery stump, and uh, this would warrant an immediate return to the operating room for control of hemorrhage. Uh, if the patient is stable, however, you can consider uh, involving interventional radiology. So in conclusion, uh, thank you, Dr. Dixon, for spending some time with me today. Thank I'm, you for I'm having ready me, to, uh, ready to go. I'm not sure I would do this as my first <laughs> procedure. But yeah, uh, you might want to get a few more under your belt before you do. But uh, I think some important things to know, you should certainly know the general anatomy um, as well as your patient's particular anatomy. As I mentioned, there may be some vessel abnormal anomalies that are important to know. Uh, it's important to know the steps of the, of the surgery, but it's, it's especially important to know, especially as a, uh, a junior resident, to know what the anatomy of the reconstruction looks like, uh, as well as to review the potential complications as you are uh, caring for these patients post-operatively. Thanks again for watching. Bye. Thanks for having me.